Okay, then. okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Jo Craggs, and I am one of the career consultants here at Newcastle University. Our session this afternoon is our Computer Science Partners uh, Industry webinar, and I'm delighted to say we have two wonderful guest speakers for you this afternoon. Um, the way the session will work today is that I'm going to hand over to Adam first and then to Eleanor. They'll introduce themselves, tell you a little bit more about who they are, what they do, their career journeys. Um, and what I'd say is whilst you're listening today, please feel free to drop any questions that you have into the chat box and we'll collate those, I'll collate those and, and ask at, at the end. Okay, so uh, Adam, if it's okay, if I can hand over to you at this point and I'll let you introduce yourself and uh, desperate to hear about uh, your career journey so far. Yeah, of course. Uh, hi everyone. Um... So my name is Adam Lissick. Um, I work for a company called Waterstones. Um, probably you never heard about Waterstones before. Um, we are um, a medium-sized IT consultancy uh, with kind of original headquarters in Durham. Um, and now I've got four offices worldwide. Um, so Sydney, Glasgow, London, um, and Durham. Durham being our biggest office. And Sydney opening in February uh, 2020, which was probably the worst time to open a remote office in the world, um, but still exciting for us, actually. Um, I guess a little bit about us at Waterstones. Um, we we blend technology with strategy and, and help um, to basically free the future of, of great businesses and great people and great organizations. And, and that's uh, very jazzy speak for what we do. Uh, but effectively, we have a uh, uh, a lot of extremely smart people working for us, helping other businesses be better at what they do through strategy and through technology. Um, and that amazing number is about 290 consultants now. Um, so about 90% of our business is consultants, so customer facing people, and about 10% of our business is our kind of admin support teams, people that help us recruit and amazing people that keep our finances up to date and buy things for us and so forth. Um, but about 270 of them are customer facing. So they'll they'll interact with customers on a daily basis. And, and I'm, I'm customer facing as well. Um, I've done a number of talks at Newcastle Uni now, but I guess um, we should probably start with where I started. So funny enough, I was exactly in your seat uh, 10 years ago um, at the partner school in 2012. Um, and I did the computer science degree at Newcastle University. Um, and my career started really early on with Waterstones. Um, and that that actually started in my first year of studies. Um, so back in the day, I found this. So Sally, Sally and Mike Waterston would actually come and visit Newcastle University, would do lectures um, as part of kind of the external visit, a lecture series that, that Newcastle offers to students. Um, and I would attend those lectures and listen to Sally Waterston and understand what business she's created. At the time, it was only, only a business of 80 people. Um, and she would be really fascinating. Uh, and she be speaking at all of us in the lecture room. Lectures were much smaller. There was only 100 of us in that, uh, at that time um, in a class. Um, and Waterstones would actually offer an internship to, to a student from first year. And funny enough, we offer the exact same internship now. So I've just, um, Alex has just joined us from Newcastle University yesterday. Uh, my team took him out for lunch today. I'm, I'm still at home with a, a tiny bit of COVID left in me, uh, but Alex has started with us from first year of Newcastle Uni. So, so we've carried that through, uh, but my, my career really started then. So 2013, um, and I had a great time at university. Um, I did the standard university journey. I lived in halls. Um, I moved to a student house. I had flatmates that didn't clean the house. Um, I've met loads of new people. Um, it was absolutely amazing. You, you never meet as many people as you do at the university. You meet people for lectures. You meet people for societies. Uh, you might pick up some part-time works. So I worked a bit part-time uh, during, during my studies as well at the sports centre um on Richardson Rose and and that was great I've met loads of people through that um and what happened during my internship is um I was offered a, a placement yeah straight away um so it was a 10 year 10 week internship um uh, I got offered a placement yeah um and I came back a year later so I took a I took a, a, a kind of a sandwich year the placement industrial placement option with my degree and um, between second and third year I joined Watson's full-time so I moved down to Durham um because that was convenient I didn't drive then I actually learned to drive when I worked at Waterstones, which was great as well because Durham's got the highest pass rate in northeast so here's the top tip uh if you're planning to do that uh don't do it in Newcastle definitely not a place to learn to drive um 
so during my placement, yeah, I've worked on various projects, uh, various sizes, so it's a, a two month project and maybe a five day project. I've done loads of software support and I've actually got second, seconded to do some IT support, which wasn't quite, quite a normal thing that we do now. Um, it was just a one off thing and a different team needed supporting for two months. And I absolutely hated support. I, I hated software operations. Um, but I had a great year. Um, I accepted my graduate offer with Waterston straight away. As, as soon as I finished my, my placement year, I had a graduate offer. So I knew I'm going back to third year. I knew I'm going to go back to Waterston's. And I graduated in 2016 uh, from Newcastle. And I've had an absolutely amazing time. You know, Newcastle Uni taught me all the theory that I needed for the role. Um, and I had some practical experience from, from what I've done at Waterston's. Um, and I kind of came back in 2016 um, and things started moving really fast, uh, mostly because I already had the experience, the working environment, the clients, the projects, the tech stack. Um, and I got promoted to senior consultant in 2018 and then following that an executive consultant in 2021, um, which it made me then step up to head of department quite quickly. As the business grew, there was a requirement to grow things. Uh, and I became a head of software operations uh, and automation in 2021. Um, although I really hated software support in my in my placement year, it turns out that actually I really loved software support, and now I employ a team that does software support for a living, uh, which is a bit of a cliche, and everyone tends to laugh at it. Um, I've currently got a team of, of 10. Um, it's nine plus one because I'm waiting for my 10th person to join me, who's actually a graduate from, from a maths degree at Newcastle Uni, and a uh, lovely lady joining us in September uh, after she had a summer holidays. Uh, funny enough, she also did a placement year. Yeah, at New, uh, at Waterstones, so uh, so she's she's coming through in September after her holidays, um, and hopefully that will be doubling over over the, the next twenty four months, perhaps maybe even a year. We can speed that up a little bit. Um, I very much keep in, in touch with Newcastle Uni, um, and and do things like this, do talks, speak to students, potential students, parents. Uh, we speak to students during the first, second year, come to visit the first, look at the work. We engage from an employer point of view, from, from kind of what you've been taught point of view and, and do uh, reviews of the curriculum and so forth, which, which is great. It's great to give some of that back. Um, and I guess you're probably sitting there thinking, yeah, he's just run me through his career uh, story, could have read on LinkedIn. Yeah, I guess that the key thing I wanted to say during this talk is you're probably sitting there thinking, well, what, what is it in it for me? And I guess there's an awful lot of opportunities at, 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 in the Northeast. Um, and that's the key thing I wanted to come and say here. You know, you're, you're very lucky and fortunate. Uh, to come through the partner scheme to secure yourself a place at, at a very, very prestigious university, a university that us as employers want to work with. Um, and the opportunities are endless. Uh, there's, there's a crazy number of IT, experienced IT jobs are open right now on the market. I would say at least 300 plus openings in the Northeast. I think 300 was the number I heard at the beginning of the year. It's definitely more than that. Um, we're becoming a massive hub for IT in the northeast in between kind of newcastle and darlington um there's an awful lot of it consultancy so people like like my business opening their offices opening hubs in northeast and saying we want a slice of this talent we want some of you guys to come and join us in the years to come but at the same time also the government is making a massive investment so we know um hmrc is moving their building um down to newcastle city center that's a massive demolition job that's just ongoing currently um so they're moving their headquarters from actually uh Gosford slash Long Benton to, to, to the middle of, of city, which is great. And we know that the treasury is going to open a building in Darlington in the year, in a in couple of years, which is also great. So there's Northeast is becoming an absolute hub for, for us, for IT professionals, for, for tech professionals that want to continue being here in Northeast. Um, and at the same time, us employers love to, taking graduates and placement students and interns, uh, mainly because if we recruit quite early on in your career, then, uh, you guys are quite bought into the, the challenges on hand, into the business, into the story. Um, it's really, really easy to train very, very early career people, not necessarily young people, early, early career people um, who want to step into that career and kind of bring you up to the speed with, with the tech that you need. And we know that the background you're coming from uh, is absolutely good enough for, for all of us. We know that what Newcastle University is teaching you is great um, because we review it. So it kind of it kind of works well for us. Um, so that's that's all I wanted to say. If you have any questions, we'll we'll pick those up. Um, happy to answer any of those.
Fantastic, Adam. Thank you so much. That's so interesting. I've, I've got a bank of questions for you, but obviously <laughs> we'll make sure everyone else gets the opportunity first. Brilliant, Eleanor. So you've uh, got that straight on the screen. So that's perfect. I'll hand over to you if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Yes. So I'm going to try and whiz through this because I have a tendency to talk a lot. So I'll try to give a quick overview. Um, but yes, I'm Eleanor, Eleanor Gorman, and I'm here to talk to you about my career path, which I consider to be a squiggly career path. So a very wiggly line from theology, the study of ancient Christian history, through to technology, which is where I'm working now. So um, this notion of squiggly careers, I don't know if it's something that you've heard about before, but it's this idea that careers aren't linear anymore, so you don't just start in one particular job in a particular employer and work your way up, but you can take lots of different twists and turns along the way um, to suit whatever you need at your particular moment in time. So I'll give you an example of that with my, my career path. And throughout all of this, I've just had this philosophy of being open to opportunities that come up. Um, I'm a natural planner and I like to have a long term plan, but I've tried to put that aside and just see what's out there, what opportunities are there um, and try and make the most of um, those opportunities and the chances that I have and that I make for myself. So this is my squiggle. So this is my squiggly career that I've kind of visualised for you and I'll take you through it through the key steps. So we start in the early years. So this is me growing up in Somerset in the southwest of England down here. And this is me in the middle um, with my brother and my sister, three children in a single parent family in um, this beautiful shade of orange council house, which we were the only orange house on the streets, which is uh, nice. Um, and yeah, so um, I grew up there in the Southwest, um, went on to comprehensive school and a sixth form college. And that's when I got my first taste of um, jobs and um, you know, working life. So. I had lots of jobs in my spare time after school and in the weekends. Those were little things like working in a cake shop, in a clothes shop, um, care home. I was a cleaner for a local supermarket and I worked in a factory for one day in a meat packing factory. I could only stand it for one day, but it was it was a useful experience. Um, so all of these jobs, they kind of um, met a purpose, met a need. So I needed to earn some money so I could get the bus to college or I could buy a cone of chips at lunch or whatever. But actually, these early stages of um, jobs really helped me to learn a lot of lessons and develop skills that I needed to, to develop for my future career. And actually, was some of the best experiences that I've had for developing customer service skills and communication skills. So um, they seem like they're very small things, but they're actually really important for my career development. I then moved up to Durham University. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do at university. I didn't know whether I wanted to do art or theology, but um, a prominent theologian came to our college and he told me I should look for Oxford, Cambridge or Durham. Um, and I knew that I probably wouldn't fit in Oxford, Cambridge for, for me personally. Um, went to uh, open day at Oxford and it was, wasn't right for me. And then I found out that um, at Durham, they have Durham Cathedral and the theology department is right beside it. So I decided I'd, I'd give that a go and absolutely loved it. Um, absolutely brilliant experience studying there. And actually I stayed there for seven years. So I did my undergraduate degree there and then my master's and my PhD in theology. Uh, during my undergraduate degree, I took on a lot of jobs again with a focus to kind of reduce my overdraft um, to make sure that I had some money to kind of by the notepads and pen things that I needed and any new clothes that I needed, but also to gain experience for the future. So I knew it was important to kind of try and get careers experience, build a CV as early on as possible. So I did a whole range of things. So um, stuffing envelopes, testing algorithms, and I only lasted in that for one day because at the time I didn't know what an algorithm was and nobody explained it to me. So that was quite interesting. Um, marking primary school tests, working in care homes, as a mentor at a school for children with special educational needs. Um, and as a postgraduate, I did some teaching and some assessment work there. And I learned a huge amount there, um, particularly you know, in terms of different kinds of skills, but also in terms of empathy and um, kind of interpersonal skills that I would use later in my career. I thought after doing my PhD that I'd stay in academia and become a lecturer, um, but actually it didn't work out that way. So. Um, after I graduated, I started working at Durham University as um, a quality assurance administrator. So doing all the kind of the admin work behind the scenes for developing new courses and modules 
And I thought that was just a stopgap until I got funding for, for further academic study. Um, but actually I ended up really loving working in universities and I didn't realize there were so many opportunities at the time. So I moved between different departments and progressed my way up and eventually started um, to focus more on project management. So the focus on project management led me into a role as a project manager for a really high profile national partnership between Durham University and the Church of England. And that was developing a new curriculum, a whole new educational program for the whole country um, for people who were trained to be priests and ministers in the Church of England. And I thought it was my dream job because it was project management, working in universities and theology. Um, but actually I came to realize that it wasn't. The, the working um, culture wasn't exactly right for me. I was doing 70 plus hour weeks and there was a lot of pressure, um, but there were some aspects of it that I did enjoy. So I stayed in it, but then uh, became a mum, which is maybe the squiggliest part of my career so far because it helped me to really reassess what I wanted from careers. So I realized I couldn't work 70 hour weeks. If I wasn't spending time with my children, I wanted to do something that had lots of meaning for me and um, something that I was really feeling um, I could add value to. So at this point here, I decided I'm going to try and move into project management, but in the, kind of the digital and tech space. And this is where I really took my step towards technology and digital. And I've focused my career since on digital project management. So I moved to Newcastle, Northumbria University in Newcastle, where I managed the Creative Fuse project there, which was all about connecting small businesses in, um, in the region who are working in digital or the creative sector or IT sector, connecting them together to find out new innovation opportunities, developing new products and services. Um, that they can offer to customers. I then moved at the end of that contract, I moved to Newcastle University where I managed the Digital Institute, which is a research institute. I was working with lots of data scientists with research software engineers and academics across the whole university on data projects and um, working closely with the Alan Turing Institute, which is the National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence in London. And that was absolutely fantastic, a real eye opener. Um, and then moved from Newcastle. I had another baby, my second baby, and I decided I would then move to Durham University and take um, a role in project management for the Tech Up Women program, which is a series of courses and boot camps to help women and people from underrepresented backgrounds, minority ethnic groups to retrain in digital and tech. So we were developing courses and delivering courses in software development and data engineering. When that contract came to an end, I then moved again, this time out of higher education. So I worked at Dynamo Northeast, which is a membership network all to do with digital and tech in the Northeast region. And I joined that team to project manage a new project called the Digital Talent Engine, which I definitely recommend having a look at, um, have a search online because the platform is designed for people who want to move into digital or tech careers in the Northeast. It's all about providing information about jobs that are available in this sector and employers in the region and how to connect up with them and vacancies. So um, as this was a new area for me, I did loads of um, training, professional development. So I started to learn coding, which is completely new for me. And I learned Python with Code First Girls and Code Academy. And I also started getting more interested in diversity and equality in tech. So I worked as a mentor for the WISE campaign, the, um, Women in Science and Engineering Network. So I left Dynamo just a few weeks ago. I resigned for that, from that role because there's been some changes that didn't quite work for me. So I was looking for something new and I decided I'm gonna have a complete career change. And I want to move more into digital, more into technology and a little away from project management. So over the past two months, I've been retraining into UX, which is user experience which is all about putting the user at the center of design processes, um, particularly for designing new digital products and services. So it might be things like apps and websites. Um, so I've been learning all about this, these things through these different organizations that offer free or low cost training, reading loads and loads of books. Um, and I have just um, been offered and accepted my first job in UX, which is starting on Monday, and I'm going to be a UX designer 
user experience designer for a small organization called Curious. And they're based in Newcastle, have about 15 people. And I didn't even know they existed until um, just maybe a month or so ago. So um, very exciting times because I have to have, I get to have a real hands-on um, impact on designing digital products and, and um, new digital services. So all new for me. Um, and I have a question mark here because I'm not sure where the future will lead, but I don't think it's going to be too squiggly. I think it's going to be quite a nice smooth line um, hopefully staying within UX and specialising in UX um, and we'll just see where the future leads. So um, I think that's probably about all I've got for my overview and then I'm happy to talk about more things and answer questions in a moment. Amazing Ella, thank you so much. I think what I've what I've really picked up on there is just the, the difference between the, the two of you in terms <laughs> of how squiggly and how many different kind of you know decisions and and just generally kind of the way that your career's taken you on the in comparison to Adam who's you know you've clearly you know linked up to Waterstones at an early point yep felt right there and felt comfortable there and grown you know with it with, well alongside the company it, you know kind of tracked its progress as well so really interesting I think if we can dive into those different perspectives um yeah, so if you have got questions, please drop them into the chat box. Um, so um, it's a question from Adam for Adam, please. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had a fast career progression at Waterstones. Is that unique to Waterstones, do you think, or is it more widely seen amongst the industry? No, I, I would I would say it's widely seen uh, across the industry. It, it's really funny you mentioned that because I did I did congratulate one of my university friends on her being promoted to a head of the part, head of data at Parked in Resorts this morning uh, on LinkedIn. So I, I, I don't think it's it's very unique to a particular organization. I think it's it's unique to the individuals. You know, not everyone wants to go into being head of department. Not everyone might want to go into a particular role. And, and it's perfectly fine to be sliding across your career rather than going up because you'll find that the tech industry is so interesting. Uh, that many, many, many early career people join and then they want to try a different part and they want to try a different part till they find something that they absolutely love. Um, so it's not very traditional. You don't have to just go up in management or up in ranks. You can actually slide across um, uh, as well. And, and that can be very successful and very rewarding, both from skills and pay point of view as well, because uh, certain roles carry different pay within the IT industry. So if you decide to hook from one to another, you might find that actually your salary might double in certain cases, which is crazy. I know that sounds really crazy, but it does happen. You might have not moved up a rank. You might have not taken more responsibility, but you're doing a completely different job and you're getting a completely different salary with it. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, definitely an exciting industry to be in for sure. Um, and that, one thing you did say, Adam, that interested me was that when you were early on in your career, when you did um, that IT support, yep. software support, that you didn't like it, and then you did. And I, yep. that, one of my questions was, was there a, was there a, a moment did you find a moment that kind of drew you back into it or was it just as you progressed in it and developed an understanding of it was there any significant kind of I think as I developed as a young person I would say um I kind of understood the need for it um and and genuinely speaking if you were to speak to any of my colleagues if someone says uh who loves software support most out of the entire division they'll probably point out my name which is which is a really weird thing because I did genuinely used to hate it I remember taking my manager who is still my manager Daniel um out well he took me out for lunch to say thank you for my placement yeah and I spent the entire hour having a moan about software support and how much I hated it um and um uh, eight years on um, and I'll lead software support for Daniel. Um, and I think he's okay with it, but I think I think I tend to grow with it. And I, what I think for me, it was the unique thing that I spotted an opportunity with it where actually we could do things differently. We could, you know, rather than just seeing it as software support, what else could we do? What, what other services could we offer our uh, customers? How, how can we develop that into an interesting offering that our people love working on? And then worked with those people with my team to develop that into even further offering. So, you know, I do very little software support now, but and so does my team, actually, because the way they manage those customers and the way they manage those projects and those applications uh, is in a way where, where we don't have to do much software support, but they, but they absolutely love the job. And I guess that's that's the aim of the game for me, really. Everyone need, wants, needs to love their job. And if you don't love the job, we need to make the, well, we need to make the job lovable, really. Um, and we can do that. We, we're in such an interesting place in tech where we can actually change things a little bit. It's not very rigid. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, 
Eleanor, a question for you, please. How did you come across the idea of UX design as a career option? I think it's a great question. Yeah. Actually. That is a fantastic question, because I'd say about um, six months ago, I didn't know it existed. And now it's like my life and uh, pouring my heart into it. I love it. So um, in my job in Dynamo, when we were developing the digital talent engine, one of the real goals of that was to um, pull together information about different career paths in digital and tech in the Northeast. And UX and digital, um, creative digital roles were one kind of grouping of roles there. So I was pulling that together as part of my job. Um, didn't know a great deal about it. Thought it sounded quite interesting. I'd seen some design thinking work at Northumbria University when I'd worked there previously. Um, and I thought, well, I'm just going to look into it a little further. And I saw that there was a free course being run by a company called And Digital. And um, that was all about getting women into tech and particularly UX. So I took that course, which was just a couple of hours each evening for six weeks. And I knew within about 10 minutes of that course that this is what I wanted to do with my life. Like it was incredible. And it was just, it felt utterly like me, like everything that I want from a career, I was gonna get from this. Um, so I just decided after that, that well, during that first session that I wanted to do this in the future. And I, I thought in the next year or two, so I'll just do some training and learn about it and then make the move. But then um, when I resigned from my job just recently, I thought, that's it. I'm just going to take the chance and I'm just going to go for it and see what happens. And um, it looks like I'm hopefully landing on my feet because I have my new job um, and I, I can't wait to start. I'm just learning more and more about it and getting more and more excited about it. So I think it's really important to keep an open mind that this is something I never would have thought about as you know that you saw that picture of me when I was like five or something I never at that age would have thought I'd be working in digital and tech never um maybe art but not technology um and now I'm moving my way around to technology but a creative and designerly kind of role um so it's keeping um, options open and actually it's really interesting because I was at Newcastle University for a careers fair a few weeks ago and it was it was particularly for people in computing and IT and everybody I spoke to must have been over 100 people the students there who were in the second or third year they were saying they either want to work in something to do with data something to do with development or UX and I was so interested that UX was up there with the other two areas so I think um, there are lots of different roles within UX whether it's research or it's um, more of the user interface design which is where you'd use coding and um you know it's it's more kind of technical focused so um there are just these areas that if you find something interests you just go find out more about it and it might just kind of might you might get hooked <laughs> sure yeah i think that's great advice isn't it just mm -hmm. to stay curious open-minded yeah. and not rule anything out Yes, definitely. Um, definitely. And that's so interesting where you started. I, I was fascinated by <laughs> theology and then yeah. and where you are now. Like you said, that 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 transition, I don't think anybody could have predicted, but no. you tapping into to different ideas. Was it whilst you were when you were when you became a mum? Was that your time just to kind of step back and reevaluate things, would you say? Yeah. yeah. I think I had this plan in my mind um when I started studying at university that I wanted to be a theologian, I wanted to be a lecturer. And that plan didn't quite work out. So step after step I just made the most of it and took different roles and went towards whatever interested me, but didn't have a proper plan. Um, and it's only when I had my first child that I actually got the time to, well, not really time, but had the headspace a bit to think about what I wanted from my career. I'm going to go back to work. What do I actually want to go back from? And I think it would be nice if we could somehow give ourselves that space throughout our lives, not just at the point of becoming a parent or some other major event, to just think, okay, what, what do I actually want? Am I going in the direction I want to be going in? Because if I'm not happy with the direction I'm heading, I just need to change it now and just, you know, explore something else. And you don't have to be on the right path. You don't need to move to the right path. You're just going towards another direction that might be right for you. And it's experimenting, which is sometimes hard and it takes some bravery sometimes. Um, but but it's definitely worth it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great insight. Thank you. Um, there's quite a few questions coming in. Let me just. So for you both, please, um, Adam, I'll pose this one to you first. What extracurricular skills would be good for your respective jobs? Yeah, and I think that that next uh, question as well on there from from Tom uh, is there a better way to learn new skills or work or volunteering? 
Um, it's funny that you ask that because the main reason why I secured my internship at Waterstones is because I volunteer as an ambulance crew with St. John Ambulance. Um, so that's just something I do on top of top of my my role. But it actually made me stand out as a candidate. You know, everyone everyone who applied was at Newcastle University. Everyone had a certain grade. Everyone did coursework. Uh, all the lecturers spoke about all eight of us in the same way. Um, now that's all boring, really, because everyone's the same. And I guess that's the same problem I'm seeing with graduates and placement students every year. You know, if if we make the process extremely fair and we mask people's names out and the gender out and we don't actually use CVs anymore. So if we just base it off people's application forms, it's all the same. It's it's you, you've got a degree or you've done a code academy skills. You know, it's all the same. And actually, it's how you become unique as a person. And those extra things being involved in societies, having a level of responsibility, having a part time job. You know, if you if you can prove on your work experience history that you've worked in Weatherspoons, washing up dishes, then to me as an employee, you're working extremely hard. I don't know if anyone ever washed up dishes in Weatherspoons, but it's really, really hard, you know, and you probably don't want to be there at like midnight washing the last set of glasses whilst, you know, people are rolling out of the door. But it's a skill and, you know, and you get rewarded further down your career for those skills. You know what it means to work hard. You know what it means to turn up to a job on time. You know what it means to get paid. You, you look forward to those things. So so we as employers very much look for that, even though it might not be IT related, even though you might have not designed a website for your dad's business or, you know, all the standard things that people tend to put on the CVs. They're all still great, but actually just those little things that you're doing out of your uh, out of your spare time or on top of your studies are, are also great. Um, when I interviewed for some summer interns this year, there was, there was many people that turned up and just said do nothing in their spare time. But we know how many lectures people have. We know what people are up to. So, you know, to say nothing, actually, it doesn't make them stand out. Whereas if you have a part-time job, if you're interested in something, if you're pursuing an interest, um, many of you might be thinking, oh, well, do I need a good programming CV? But I think I I'm with Eleanor on this. You know, you need to explore the IT path. You need to have a look what's out there. The whole spectrum programming is one tiny little bit. I I thought when I finished university um, in 2016, if I'm going back to Waterstones, I'm going to work on this massive programming project. I'm going to be a software engineer. It's going to be great. I do very little writing code. If, if I probably write about five lines of code a week now, uh, you know, compared to my colleagues who probably turn for like thousands of lines of code every week, it's, it's nothing. Don't think you're going to get stuck in one career, but learning your skills is great. Things like attending those courses. There's loads of free courses, low cost courses. Uh, there's loads of trials you can sign up for. There's lots of YouTube videos coming to career first, exploring those career paths, talking to people, getting some ideas and then going and exploring that. There's plenty of resources you can do and you can stick all of that on your CV. So definitely really worthwhile uh, doing, but it doesn't have to be IT or tech. It could be something completely different. It was for me. Um, I still I still volunteer as an ambulance crew. You'll still see me out there, but that was just a unique thing that made me stand out of a crowd. Brilliant, thank you. And yeah, you've, you've hit on a point there I was, I was going to bring into conversation. You beat me to it, absolutely. Just about demonstrating those attributes, isn't it? And, and I, you know, I speak to a lot of students who will say, oh, well, I'm applying for a job in, in X, but ABC is just not relevant from my CV. And obviously I'll make the point of, yes, it is, because, you know, it's what it stands for and it's shown resilience if you've worked in a pub and you've had difficult customers, if you've washed up all day and night, like you said, it's, the, it's all of those softer attributes and soft skills if you like that really shine through so not to dismiss anything really is it and, and like you said try and seek those extra opportunities that will make you stand out so brilliant uh, Eleanor would you have anything to add to that please I think just to say yeah all of that and I don't think it's necessarily a matter of whether it should be volunteering or paid work or training I think it's just something that enables you to develop and um, evidence those skills. So I was speaking to someone recently who's the CEO of a small business in um, Newcastle to do with data and they're recruiting, they're growing a lot. And this, this man said, um, the things I really look for in applications, I love it when an applicant will say they've been the coach of a child's football club or they've worked in a bar because that means you've got excellent communication skills you can kind of manage difficult situations and you can work with customers who would effectively in a working environment be clients or customers that, that you're working with on um, delivering services. And, um, so I think um, definitely communication, interpersonal skills, um, anything where you're working with people. And I think that can be particularly important in computing and tech 
because people who have those really strong technical skills might not necessarily have those kind of that cognitive empathy and those connecting with people, communicating with people. So if you've got both of those, it's a really strong kind of package to offer an employer. So um, that's what I'd add. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Great answer. Um, actually, we'll stay with you, Eleanor. Great question. At any point, did you fear it was too late to change career direction? If so, how did you overcome that fear? That's an amazing question. So I turned 40 this year. I've got two children. My wrinkles are getting more and more every day. And I always think it's too late. But yeah, you get those times when you just think, yes, it's, it's I, I've missed the boat. And I totally at points have thought I've missed the boat in this. But then you think, well, no, it's not too late. We're going to be working till we're like 95 or something. We've got, I've got a long career ahead of myself, whether I, I'm happy with that or not. And, um, you know, it's never too late to be happy in your life. And if you feel that something isn't right for you or that um, you could do something that makes you really happy, I don't think it's ever too late to go for that. And I think um, I, I don't want to be in a position where I'm regretting not having done something. Um, I'd rather just work really hard and see whether it works out. And if it doesn't, that's OK. I'll go and do something else. You know, there are always different options out there. It doesn't always seem like it, but there are. Um, so, yes, absolutely. I do feel like I've left it too late sometimes. Um, but, you know, I think it's working out. I don't want to speak too soon. I don't want to jinx it, but I think it's working out. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, and stay with you for another question, if you don't mind. Um, was there a reason you stuck with, with working in universities, even when changing oh, yeah. career path? Does it provide yeah. extra experience or leverage to gain a position at other companies? Yeah, I, I love working in universities. Um, so I hadn't realised, I hadn't thought of a university as an employer before I started working in one, and I hadn't realised the complete diversity of roles and the ability to move between different teams, almost different professions within a single organization. And what I found I really enjoyed about working in the university is that you can get all different perspectives on the same, a similar kind of um, area of work. So you can get a perspective on what university does for research or for students or for external engagement with businesses or for outreach work. Um, I help, I, it gave me the chance to really understand how a very large, very complex organization works. And then working between different universities, I could see how that model works for different organizations, depending on their, their different missions and goals. And um, so I love that. I love education and I, I really um, support what universities are doing. Um, and they're excellent employers. I mean, the, the support packages that you get, the benefits packages, the flexibility, the progression, the training, University is a great place to work um, and I do miss it a bit. You might be able to tell, I do miss it slightly. Um, but uh, yeah, it's all experience. But the things that I've learned from working in a university is so relevant to other sectors because the university covers so many different things um, and works with so many different stakeholders that I can just bring that into a, a wide range of roles. So um, yeah, that's, that's why I, I chose to stay in the university. Before, before moving out, <laughs> but I'm still working closely with them. Absolutely, yeah, it's yeah. really insightful, <laughs> thank you. Um, Adam, if I can come to you next then, um, and it's a question for you both, so but I'll, I'll give you a chance to grab a glass of water. Um, question from Okan that says, how is your work-life balance? Do you feel you have more freedom in the tech industry? That is an extremely good question. Um, I think being quite honest, for the past eight years, I probably go up and down in swings and um, I sometimes have an excellent work, work life balance where, you know, I will just work my hours and I'll make sure to have breaks and no, no projects ever overrun and no customers ever ring me past five o'clock um, and the world is a beautiful place. And sometimes I go in the extreme opposite of I'll have a customer begging me for a call at half five on a Friday because they're up against it. And, and I will join that call, not because anyone's telling me to join that call because I personally feel bad for them. Um, and, and that's just the nature of, of kind of the work, but we do have an awful amount of flexibility. And I'd say in tech, we, we are extremely lucky in the flexibility that we get up. My other half is an architect and I have seen the lack of flexibility that they get, but we do have, um, absolute flexibility in in tech and loads of people will offer things like flexible work hours um loads of companies look at things like extended maternity paternity adoption surrogacy leave um things like doctor's appointments or dentist appointments you know I have a dentist appointment on friday no one really minds that i have a dentist appointment at 10 a.m on a friday i'll just 
go to my dentist appointment and I'll come back when I'm ready, when I feel like coming back and my jaw stopped hurting. Um, so we do have absolute flexibility. I, I think it's fair to say that some of the roles in IT don't have that flexibility. You know, if you're a, a security engineer and you're working a night shift, you may have to work a night shift and you might not perceive that as flexibility. But for some people, night shifts really work. You know, for some families, some parents will will just, you know, cater around the children and work a night shift and then look after the kids after they come back from school and so forth. So it might work, but you might not see as flexibility. Some people might work in, in environments um, if you imagine an environment like a police control room when you're supporting their systems, you might not be able to have a dentist appointment because if there isn't an IT engineer to support the systems, then people's lives could be in danger. So you have to be very careful how you how you perceive flexibility and uh, freedom. But we do definitely have freedom and flexibility. And I think depending on what businesses you work, you may also have freedom in terms of design decisions or tech decisions. But again, all of that is very reasonable. Um, so I couldn't wake up tomorrow morning and go, well, I know today I've done C sharp, but tomorrow I'll do PHP because that's an absolutely crazy decision for a business to make. Uh, but actually with time, you may be, be able to suggest things that you know could lead to that decision. So we do have freedom to do that as well. I don't know if you want to add more to that, uh, Eleanor, uh, than I've covered. Yeah, that's great. And I think it does vary a lot. Um, but I've been very lucky with my role. So um, with having the two children and especially everything around pandemic and school pickups and drop offs and children's illnesses, I need flexibility. So that's one of the absolute um, essentials that I'm looking for in a job. You know, possibly that as much as I look for the salary, I look for flexibility. Um, and I don't always need to use that flexibility, but I need to know I'm working for an employer who understands the situation I'm in and understands that I will need that flexibility and will give me that. So um, I've been incredibly lucky the past two roles, particularly um, where my work has been very flexible. I haven't been micromanaged. I can start when I like and finish when I like, as long as I make up the hours. If I need to dip out for an appointment or to pick up the children or something, then I can make up those hours. Or, you know, if I feel like I've worked particularly hard, then I don't even need to make up those hours. And, you know, there's a lot of trust that has gone um, into the roles that I've had. And I really, really value that. And I think they've got a lot more out of me because I really value the trust that's been put in me and onto me. So, um, yeah, I think there's that. My current company as I'm moving to, they work four and a half days. So I get Friday afternoons off, which is nice. I think Atom Bank works a four day week. Um, but there is a lot of flexibility out there. And I think companies are becoming more and more open to kind of being, being aware of the challenges that people face, whether they're parents or whether they're carers or people who just need to balance things in life. And I think there's a greater understanding of diversity and inclusion and the need to support that in working environments. We've got a long way to go, um, but I think a lot more companies are becoming aware of this. And it's something that should come through in job application, job um, advert, adverts, um, and something you can get a sense of from company websites and LinkedIn pages. Um, but you can also talk, I think, you can talk quite freely about when you're speaking with people from companies. I 100% I, I agree with that. And, and watch out for things like, so for example, um, we offer unlimited holidays and reset days for, for mental health, you know, because we're only human. But if you think about tech teams and tech businesses, it's the people that make the business. So for me, you know, without my team, without my colleagues, I wouldn't have a job ever um, because we wouldn't exist. So, you know, people are the most amazing, uh, people are the most important things to us as a business, really, the most important assets, you know, we can deal with our computers, we can deal with our things, we can go and replace those quite quickly, but we can't replace people. So you'll you'll get a feeling from job descriptions. You can look up things on places like Glassdoor, which is a, a job review board. Um, take take things, read them, understand them, question them, ask those questions on the interviews. And, and again, the same with diversity, you know, challenge businesses to what they're doing towards diversity. It's, it's a very common question I get in an interview now and no one should be afraid to answer it. Um, and the answer should be, we don't do enough. Um, but um, if anyone says <laughs> anything else, I would question them further. Um, but there's definitely, definitely areas, you know, you should be questioning in your interviews and things like, uh, what freedom do you get or what uh, what flexibility do you get in role is really, really important to cover before you accept a role so you don't feel trapped and you and you don't hate it from day one. That's great advice. Absolutely great advice. And that idea that, you know, you're not just going into kind of shoehorn yourself into that role. It's really thinking about that cultural fit. 
um, and what's going to be right for you from a lot of different perspectives and I think that's just really good to hear directly from yourselves that you should be challenging that diversity <laughs> yeah. piece if, if necessary yeah um another question's come in there um for yourself Eleanor how did you find the balance between being a mum and balancing your career <laughs> yeah that's been really difficult yeah at, at points it's been really difficult so it took a lot of adjustment at the start but that was because I was in the role where I was used to working 70 hour week and you know, I don't think that's healthy for anybody, let alone a mum, a new mum. So since then, you know, I've found other roles that, again, more flexible. And um, I think that has made it a lot easier for me. Um, so it's a bit of an adjustment. I have been looking for roles that are part time or and I've worked in those roles or I've gone into a full time role. And then once I've been in post for a long enough time, ask whether I can go part time and those offers that those um, requests have always been accepted so I've got a, a better balance of home time and um, work time um, but after having my second baby it was less of an adjustment because I wasn't in that intensive working environment and I found some um, organizations like I said I actively looked for places that were flexible and will understand the position I'm in and it's been much easier and I, I'd probably say I'm more excited about my career now than I've ever been and like I say I'm going to be 40 this year and I'm so excited about where I'm working and and it is hard to get the work-life balance because I, I always feel guilty when I'm at work because I'm not with my children and when I'm with my children I'm not doing work and I feel like I'm never doing enough but I do a lot when I look at it objectively and um and I think the two of them that work life and being a mum they both kind of um they're mutually beneficial so being a mum has helped me to see things in a different way and to develop skills and approaches in, that are different to how I would have worked before having a child and that I think that's positive and also work helps to give me something to feel like um I've got my own identity and you know I'm setting a good example for my children and you know my, my son is interested in coding and he's only seven because he's seen me do some little code first girl thing. So, yeah, I think as long as you can see it as a whole package and you're in a supportive environment, I think it's totally manageable, totally doable. And it makes it it really enriches your life. Um, but it's finding that right environment for you, I think. Brilliant answer. Thank you. Really nice insight there to get gain from you. Um, I have a hundred questions here, but we're desperately running short on time. Um, there's one question just come in there, touching on the, the subject we're on before, previously. What red flags are there for jobs that are anti-employee or have bad working environments? Any thoughts on that, please? Um, that's a really hard question, because I guess um, there, there's some generic red flags. You know, we could sit here and talk about things like racism, sexism, um, your kind of standard things. You know, if it makes you feel extremely uncomfortable or unsafe, then obviously that's really common sense. Um, but then I guess everyone is looking for different things. Um, so, you know, someone might say to you, what do you mean you've got set working hours? How can you work like that? And it works for an awful amount of people in life to have set working hours and they absolutely love it. They've got a clean cut, clean start. They don't mind it. They, they absolutely love the set working hours. And some people might turn around and say, well, I, I wouldn't do anything that doesn't have flexible working hours. Um, th th there's various red flags that I would probably uh, think about, you know, if uh, things turn out to be maybe a lie in your interview, I would probably start questioning that, but it's really hard to, start seeing them through the interview process now you might be lucky enough for the recruitment process that maybe the company that you're going to work for will let you to come and visit the office or let you go and spend some of the time in the office that's normally a really nice feeling to get to get a feel from the employees and see that look you know if everyone's looking miserable on an office floor why well, they're all looking miserable if they all look happy then you know you can't you kind of great but this looks like a, a nice place but it, it's really hard to detect those in an interview um you know, to, to do question and do compare and go to loads of interviews, apply for loads of jobs, uh, get as many interviews as you can and have offers on the table to choose from, because sometimes it might not just be the salary that turns your eye. It might be the work. It might be the people. It might be the attitude. It might be their behavior for the recruitment process. You know, little things like whenever I offer someone a job, I give them my mobile number straight away on day one. So they can text me. They can ring me if they've got any problems. If the old employer's been a bit rubbish or something, they can just text me. And I think people appreciate that a little bit, but not everyone does that. So I guess you'll get a different feeling for different job offers. 
don't ever feel pressured into accepting the job. Quite a lot of graduates get pressured into, here's this job at 10 a.m. I need to hear by four, four o'clock. No, no, they don't. They're literally, they're literally dumb. If they want to hear by four o'clock, it's because they want you to say, if you say no, they're going to offer it to someone else. That's the only reason why they're doing that. Don't ever do that. Don't pressure. Sleep on it. Talk to your parents. Talk to your friends. Talk to your better half, whoever. Think about it. It's a big, yeah. big step. Yeah, brilliant advice. Thank you, Adam. Um, Ellen, if you don't mind, if I just jump to you, because there is one last question, I'm going to try and squeeze all of them in. Um, would you say that data science is common within the UX design industry? I don't know enough about it, to be honest, about the number of people who are in UX um, and where they come from through from data science. But um, I would say that um, there are different places where you can work in UX. So you can work in an agency where um, the, the agency takes on clients and you work for projects um, that are across a whole different range of sectors, or you could work in house at a company. So for example, working for McDonald's as a UX researcher and you just work for McDonald's on their project. Um, I have worked recently with an agency for the digital talent engine, an agency called Media Works. They're really big, but Gateshead based, really excellent. Um, and they have different teams within the organization who all work together. So you'll have UX designers effectively working with um, working with the with data scientists working with um, the kind of the technology people who come up with the solutions and build build the, the technology platforms and you have all these different teams coming together and working together and you also have some crossover between those teams so I imagine that might be a good place for someone who's working who's got a data science background where you could be working in a data science role but having an input to kind of the design process or, or the other way around. Um, I'm not sure, but I do know from that careers fair that there were lots of people, particularly from the MSc, the master's course in data science at Newcastle and the um, undergraduate degree computing who were really interested in UX. So I imagine it, if there aren't many people in data science who are now working in UX, they're definitely going to be more. And UX is a hugely growing area. And I think having that kind of data background would be absolutely excellent because in UX, you have UX research where you work with um, with users directly and carry out research and having that kind of understanding of data and how you compile, collect it and analyze it and get some kind of insight from it. I can imagine that'd be hugely um, useful. But I don't know if that answers the question, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> I, I was just gonna say, I, having met a handful of uh, data scientists already, they're, they're not interested in how it looks. And actually they tend to be very analytical thinkers who can talk you through the maths behind and the pie from behind it all um which is in the most interesting way of presenting things so you'll definitely want to be friends with with someone in ux to a make it pretty but also make it presentable because actually a, a data scientist can really go down a, a rabbit hole of studying the data and they can tell you all about this data but perhaps conducting a presentation or making it useful to end users is not a thing so i think it's kind of cross working teams really um you, you definitely have an awful amount of collaboration in it and you, you're going to accept that your boundary is somewhere which i think is sometimes really hard to accept but you're going to have to start sharing and kind of cuddling each other and uh, and sharing ideas and working as a team uh, together rather than just kind of a single person doing doing it all brilliant thanks for, to both of you for, for those comments there on that on that question um there's one last question that i've been asked to pose to you both and i'm not going to let you off easily with this last question i have to ask, i have to admit um but uh for you both considering your time at university and your career what one bit of advice would you like to share with our partner students before we wrap up the session, please? Um, I think one, one from me um, is, is definitely have fun. If you, if you haven't done, uh, if you haven't joined societies before and you haven't done certain sports, go and do them. Because when you, when you graduate, you turn a little bit more boring uh, and you become a bit more tired from working um, and you have less time during the week and you might not want to do things like parachuting in your spare time. But actually, university is a great time to explore those extra curriculum things and you don't think about it because you'll start and you'll focus on your course and you'll you'll get your reading list and you'll start reading all the books and you get yourself to the library and then coursework deadlines come really fast and next thing you know you kind of your first year's over so definitely get stuck in, in those extra curriculum activities and definitely start kind of thinking about your your path and where you want to end up and occupy your summers with things like internships it's a, it's a great way to start so that'd be my my two tips of 
try things you haven't tried before and, and push yourself out there. And I know it's really hard, but remember in your first year, everyone's in the same boat because uh, no one's ever done, you know, this sport or that sport or joined this weird society. And actually you'll, you'll be there thinking, well, am I just being weird? But actually, no, you're totally fine. And you'll make some really good friends for life. Fantastic. Thank you. And it brings us back to that original point that Eleanor brought up, I think, about the curiosity, doesn't it? Just staying open and curious yeah. and really just expanding. Eleanor, any other advice you'd like to yeah. leave with, please? Yeah, it might sound a bit airy-fairy, but I think, like, uh, just be yourself, like, absolutely be yourself. And this is something that's really coming through to me as I grow older. You know, university is a fantastic time to explore who you are, to meet people who are on the same wavelength as, as you, and to really just be yourself and explore who you are as a person and I don't mean in terms of careers but in terms of your life in terms of what you want from life you know what your interests are exploring new things and finding out what works for you um I think that's just something really important throughout the whole of your life just to try you know to feel comfortable being you and being yourself that is such a positive note to finish on that authenticity isn't it just to be you yeah and any employer wants to see that if you're trying to be something for somebody else not going to work yeah definitely yeah. there everyone else is taken they say don't they so you're the only person who can be you and I think sometimes it's there's a pressure to feel like you have to be like the person who's at the top of your class or you have to be like the person in the suit who's in the job that you want to be in but you know you are you and you will bring something unique that has never been bought before in that same package so um yeah just be confident in being you and finding out who you are it's a, it's a great time university for doing that Brilliant. Thank you so much. Sadly, we do have to finish the session there, guys. Um, huge thank you to you both. Absolutely really insightful, really interesting to speak with you both this afternoon. So I'm sure I'll, along with everyone else in the room, thanks so much for taking time out.